Thank you very much for that. That was a blessing. Uh, we're in the book of Mark, Mark chapter number three. Next Sunday, my family will be at the Stillwaters Baptist Church, Kitty Hawk, North Carolina. And um, we'll be on vacation. It'll be fun being in church next Sunday. No one's going to ask me any tough uh, questions or anything. I could just go and be a taker. I don't have to be a giver. And um, you're going to be in good hands. Uh, Brother Tom Stiles, Dr. Tom Stiles, evangelist out of our church. Uh, you don't see him here very much. I always joke with him. He's, he's uh, one of our worst members here. Uh, 
He's got a full preaching schedule, so he's always out preaching, but he's going to be preaching for us all day. Uh, next Sunday, um, a week from Wednesday night, uh, my father will be doing the Bible study, so be in your place there uh, for the Wednesday evening service, and I know that you'll have a good time in the Lord, uh, and so but we'll be on vacation, so we're looking forward to that. Uh, well, this morning, in our text this morning, we're going to be reading verses 7 down through verse number 20, and we're going to see that our Lord is calling to himself uh, his 12 apostles. And uh, we'll be in the same portion of Scripture this evening. Tonight is going to be 11 principles on making disciples. And um, I'm really more excited about this evening's message than this morning. So if you have to choose between coming this morning or this evening, I would choose to come this evening. Um, but no, we do have, we have an important text here before us, and I know it's going to be a blessing to us all. Uh, but we'll read from verse 7 down to verse number 20. So when you find your place there, let's stand together for the reading of God's Word. Mark chapter 3, verse number 7. It says there, But Jesus withdrew himself with his disciples to the sea. And a great multitude from Galilee followed him, and from Judea, and from Jerusalem, and from Idumea, and from beyond Jordan. And they about Tyre and Sidon, with a great multitude, when they had heard what great things he did, came unto him. And he spake to his disciples that a small ship should wait on him because of the multitude, lest they should throng him. For he had healed many, inasmuch that they had pressed upon him for to touch him as many as had plagues. And unclean spirits, when they saw him, fell down before him and cried, saying, Thou art the Son of God. And he straightly charged them that they should not make him known. And he goeth up into a mountain, and calleth unto him whom he would, and they came to him. And he ordained twelve that they should be with him, and that he might send them forth to preach, and to have power to heal sicknesses, and to cast out devils. And Simon he surnamed Peter, and James the son of Zebedee, and John the brother of James, he surnamed them Boner Jesus, that, which is the sons of thunder. And Andrew and Philip, and Bartholomew, and Matthew, and Thomas, and James the son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, and Simon the Canaanite, and Judas Iscariot, which also betrayed him, and went, and went into an house. And the multitude cometh together again, so that they could not so much as eat bread. And uh, let's stop there. Let's ask the Lord's blessing on his word, and we'll um, look at Jesus ordaining the twelve. And let's pray. Uh, Lord, we thank you for just the privilege it is to be in your house together today. Uh, and Lord, we thank you that you just have drawn us from different areas and different corners of our uh, location here and brought us together, separated us from the world by your Holy Spirit. Lord, we thank you for uh, being born again into the family of God. And we thank you that we uh, have been able to gather together around you and, and sing together and minister to one another in song. Lord, we thank you just for encouraging words that we've already received uh, from the brethren. And Lord, I pray now that you would just bless this time as we look into your holy word. Lord, I pray that your word would have its place in our heart. I pray that you would just uh, clear a path for us this morning uh, through your word. Lord, I pray that your, your scripture would just find uh, an understanding in our minds and openness in our hearts. And Lord, I pray that you would truly help us to desire to answer the Lord's calling to be one of your disciples. And Lord, I pray that you would just move and have your will and your way in the service this morning. We pray in Jesus' name, amen and amen. You may be seated. And Jesus ordaining the 12, the first thing I want you to notice here uh, is that Jesus is at the height of his popularity and the multitudes, the Bible says, are thronging him. If you look at verse number 7, it says, But Jesus withdrew himself from his disciples to the sea, and a great multitude from Galilee followed him and from Judea. 
Um, so the southern regions are coming up to the northern regions, where it says from Jerusalem to Idumea. This is a 250-mile region that are coming to see the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, and remember, this is before uh, the days where you could hop into your motor car <laughs> and head on down the highway 75 miles an hour uh, and go 250 miles for a meeting you know, in an afternoon. Uh, there's tens, perhaps tens of thousands of people who are coming to see the Lord. And I want you to notice that the Lord is going to separate himself from uh, the multitude in the height of his popularity. Uh, he is going to separate himself from the multitude as he presses down to the sea. Uh, I know uh, probably a lot of you have been on uh, the water in a boat before, and it's amazing. You can hear a conversation all the way across the water. Uh, someone could be whispering to each other, and you could hear them several hundred yards away because this, this uh, natural sound travels. One of the things that you see here uh, in verse number 9, it says, And he spake to his disciples that a small ship should wait on him because of the multitude, lest they should throng him. And we see that many times in the Gospels that Jesus used a ship as his pulpit, they would pull out a little bit into the sea. And there's a natural amphitheater there. Some of you have been there to the Mount Beatitudes where uh, people could sit down in the grass and look over the Sea of Galilee and Jesus could literally teach thousands of people at this time. And he separated himself uh, by way of the ship out into the sea uh, so that people could hear what he is saying. The end of the Gospel of John, chapter number one, uh, it says that many came to him, but he did not commit himself uh, to them. So they came to Jesus, but Jesus did not commit himself to them because it says he knew what was in all men. So imagine if Jesus is preaching this morning and uh, he stands down here during the altar and uh, come, come to me if you want to, uh, if, if you have some sort of a decision. Uh, come to me if you uh, want to commit your life to God. Come to me. And he comes to me and you shake his hand and say, Lord, I want to follow you. I want to be your disciple. I believe in you. Amen. So, and in the Gospel of John, chapter number one, it says that he did not believe in them. Jesus, I believe in you. I want to follow you. Uh, you can't because I do not believe in you. And it says, because he knew what was in man. Remember the Lord Jesus Christ was a unique preacher because he could see down into the hearts of men. Yes, Praise God, I can't uh, see into your hearts this morning uh, and to hear what you're saying in the back of your mind or uh, what you're daydreaming about. Uh, but the Lord could see all men. He could tell what was in men and he knew what was in the hearts of men. He knew the motivations for people following him. Uh, and let's face it, uh, we, along with all of these multitudes, have a multiplicity of problems and heartaches and uh, aches and pains and diseases and things that we want to get fixed. And, uh, and there's people from all over with all sorts of problems that are coming to Jesus. And Jesus cares about your heartache and he cares about your pain and he cares about your struggle and he cares about whatever that you're going through this morning. Uh, but people wanted their life fixed so they could go on living their life away from Jesus. Yeah, and they were looking at Jesus you, uh, as perhaps a good luck charm or a rabbit's foot, uh, you know, as a, uh, you know, a cross necklace that you wear around. And I'm for cross necklaces, amen. Uh, but uh, it just is not a good luck charm for your life is that Jesus is a person. And if you want to truly be blessed from top to bottom, you have to come to the Lord Jesus Christ, not just to take care of your trouble, not just to take care of your aches and your pains or your anxiety or your worries or your toils. You have to come for to him for who he Amen. is. Amen. Amen. Gospel of John chapter number six. Uh, we see the many, many multitudes um, enjoyed the blessings and the miracles of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, and I want to say that, that, the, that uh, multitudes of people enjoy the blessings and the miracles of the Lord Jesus Christ even to this day. Uh, do you know that billions of dollars are still given in the Lord's name? Look at the average hospital or uh, average charity group. Most all of them are predominantly Christian. Uh, look at when there's a tragedy around the world. Uh, who, who sends the bulk of the... Uh, 
amount of money and the donations and the manpower. Uh, people are still being ministered to in the name of uh, the Lord. So there's multitudes that gather around Jesus for some sort of a blessing, but there's only going to be a small fraction of them who are going to be his disciples. So in the Gospel of John chapter number 6, uh, multitudes there on the shoreline, he just broke the bread, he blessed it, and multitudes ate of his bread and were filled, and they wanted to immediately make him king. But Jesus looked at them and said, unless you eat of my body and drink of my blood, you will have no part with me. He says, you've experienced physical blessing, but you have not partaken of the spiritual blessing of my life. And many, the Bible says, turned away. Gospel of John, chapter 6, verse number 66. The 666 verse in the Gospel of John. Many turned away. But who didn't turn away? The disciples. And he turned to his disciples and said, Will you also go away? Many will go away from Jesus. However, here's what his disciples said. Whither shall we go? Thou hast the words Amen. of eternal life. We are here for you. We are not here to just get something from you. And this is the Amen. true heart of Amen. a disciple. Amen. So the multitudes were thronging him. Uh, and it says he, he went out in a ship and I... I uh, had a little taste of this. In 1992, we went to the Ukraine on a missions trip, uh, and the, you know, the Iron Curtain was calling, uh, coming down, uh, and then uh, Westerners were going to these Soviet bloc countries, and uh, in that area, they were open to anything that was Western. I mean, you want to really impress a Ukrainian, uh, you could wear a pair of blue jeans, man. They thought that was the coolest thing in the world, anything from the West. Go to the Ukraine with a pallet toilet paper, man. They would think you were like a king or something like that. I mean, anything coming from the West. Uh, they sit up on the streets and preach. And these Westerners preaching through uh, an interpreter, they come and uh, in the village of Chikasi, you know, we'd have 900 plus people stop in the middle of the streets and, uh, and people pastors from America preaching the gospel through an interpreter. 900 people would stop to hear the gospel message. And uh, when the invitation is given, this is how they did it then, uh, is that people would come forward and pray to receive Christ. And there'd be lines of people and they'd hold the microphone and you're praying there in front of God and everybody and your whole village uh, and praying and asking uh, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ to be your savior. I remember that we were giving away a pallet of Bibles right there in the village of Chikasi. I was 15 years old at the time, um, and not too many times when you're 15 years old does your life flash before your eyes, but that was, uh, that was one of the times that I thought I was going to die. And what happened is uh, we had the pallet of Bibles, we announced that we're giving the Bibles away, and it was after the service, and all of a sudden hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds of people started crowding in to get these Bibles and the people at the front of the line when they get their Bible they couldn't leave because the crowd was thronging they were coming in and pressing and and uh, I got knocked over on the ground and there's all these uh, Ukrainians standing over top of me I thought I was gonna be trampled to death someone helped me up uh, and it was a scary time so I can't imagine what it must have been like in Jesus time when he is performing miracles and everybody who he touches is healed is that people are pressing in and people are thronging him and right at this moment in time his popularity is through the roof every time he would cast out a devil remember uh, that the devil prefers to work incognito but when the light of the world is come he exposes the devil uh, and when Jesus comes into your life and Jesus comes into your house guess what's going to be revealed uh, the devil is going to be revealed inside your household and these devils are calling out and identifying the Lord as the Messiah and he's telling them to hold your peace and one of the reasons why is because all of these people are following him following Jesus for all the wrong reasons uh, and these people were not going to be able to take up the cross and follow him they were not going to follow the Lord Jesus Christ to the cross but a select group of people are and I want to challenge you this morning to be in the select number of people who will be the Lord's 
disciples. And so it says he separated himself, and it says he separated himself unto a mountain to pray. And the Lord Jesus Christ, we see from Scripture, was a mountain climber. He was separating himself continuously. In the Gospel of Luke, chapter number 6, uh, when Luke records this, it says that he spent all night in prayer unto God, and then he ordained the twelve. So there's three things this morning we're going to look at. One is the people of God's choosing. The people of God's choosing. So look at chapter 3. Look at verse number 13. And it says, He goeth up into a mountain, and calleth unto him whom he would, and they came unto him. And we're going to see the types of people who God calls. And these people are going to be the most mundane, ordinary, unlettered, and average people that you can possibly imagine. So imagine going into a really ornate church, you know, and you look around the church and uh, you look at the beautiful stained glass all the way up to the ceiling, way, way up there. And uh, you see Jesus somewhere way above and then just below Jesus up on the stained glass, you see these 12 austere looking men with holy faces looking down upon you with a scowl. Like they knew what you did this last week. Disapproving look. Why can't you be as holy as me? Why can't you be from, uh, from the position uh, that I'm in? And nothing could be further from the truth uh, is that God used the base and he used the ordinary and God would mold and God would shape these men. Uh, but we are, but uh, it was going to be because of the potter. It wasn't going to be because of the clay. And he chose the most unlikely characters uh, to be a part of his king, uh, kingship and part of his kingdom. Uh, the Bible calls them unknown but well-known. Uh, out of these 12 men, six of them go on to live in obscurity. We have no idea what ever happened to these men. Uh, the others, we'll look at this a little bit tonight, uh, is that uh, many others went on to different regions of the world. Uh, Brother Gulshan is going off to India. The Apostle Thomas was the missionary to India. He was going to go as far east as humanly possible and be the apostle. And they're all going to go to different regions. And really, they're going to be unknown, yet well-known. God is going to get his work done by all different types of people. Uh, is here, has here listed the group of names. Look, if you will, to verse number 16. And it says, In Simon, Peter, he, in, in Simon he surnamed Peter. So we have Peter, and uh, here's the impetuous one. Jesus would tra transfer, and uh, he would uh, mold him from Simon into Peter. He's going to be unstable to a stable stone. Then they have James and John, verse number 17. And James, the son of Zebedee, and John, the brother of James, he's surnamed uh, Bonerges, or which is the sons of Thunder, James and John. Here's these two brothers. Uh, John, of course, is going to write uh, the Gospel of John. He is going to be the disciple whom Jesus loved. Uh, we would say that he was the disciple of love. He's the one who leaned on Jesus' breast, heard his heartbeat. Uh, but Jesus had a nickname for these two boys. They were called the Sons of Thunder. And if you remember, uh, they're the ones that wanted to call fire down from heaven upon their enemies. And so the Lord's going to change the nature of these men. Uh, James is going to be the first martyr we see in the book of Acts. He's going to die for the Lord. And then Andrew. Uh, Andrew uh, is the Bible usher. Three different times in the Bible we see him bringing others to Jesus. He brings Peter to Jesus. Uh, he brings the Greeks to Jesus. He brings uh, the boy with the five loaves and two fishes to Jesus. Then we have next Bartholomew here. And it says, and, um, it says and James, the, the son of Zebedee, and John, the brother of James, he surnamed uh, Bonerges, which is the sons of thunder, and Andrew and Philip and Bartholomew. And, uh, and then Matthew and Thomas. Matthew uh, is going to be the tax collector who is going to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. He leaves the receipt of custom uh, and he goes after uh, the Lord. And then we have Thomas. We know him as Doubting Thomas. We have James, the son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, and Simon the Canaanite. And then in verse number 19, it says, And Judas Iscariot, which also betrayed him, and they went into a house. And so here is the twelve whom the Lord chooses. God chooses many different men from all different walks of 
life. Um, God is still in the business of doing this. If you turn to 1 Corinthians chapter number 1, if you will, 1 Corinthians chapter number 1. So 1 Corinthians chapter number 1, um, look at verse number 26 there. Here's the Apostle Paul. He's writing to the Corinthian church, and this is the most talented church. Their, uh, their talent and their ability is at an all-time high, and their spirituality is at an all-time low. Uh, and the Apostle Paul wrote this severe letter, and he's rebuking them. Uh, and one of the things that he informs them right out of the blocks is that uh, you are not anything much. Take a look in the mirror in reality, and I want you to realize that God has not chosen the mighty things of this world. That God's chosen the foolish things. And he says, you there in Corinth, I know you. And you are foolish things, and God is going to use the foolish things to confound the wise. Uh, so look at verse number 26. It says, for ye see your calling, brethren... Okay, the disciples were called. Uh, these Corinthians were called. For ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many uh, wise men after the flesh, and not many mighty, and not many noble are called. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of this world to confound the things which are mighty. And the base things of this world, and the things which are despised, hath God chosen, yea, and the things which are not to bring to naught the things that are. Here's the reason why. Verse number 29. Uh, that no flesh should glory in his presence. Uh, God says this. My glory I will not share with another. You know how, what percentage of God's glory that you're going to uh, share in? Zero. He says we, we're, we are... We are not going to share. The Trinity is not going to share our glory with another. And if you're a reflection of God's glory, they're going to say, man, that is all the Lord. That is not him. I know him. And it has nothing to do with him. It has to do with the Lord. So look at, uh, look at the next verse here. It says, um, verse 30, But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who... Of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Look at chapter 2, verse number 1. Paul talks about himself. Uh, and here's another apostle, okay? And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech, nor of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of men's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power. That your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. So, back to the people who God chooses. So, Matthew is a publican. He's a tax collector. He is a traitor to the Jewish race. He is a traitor to Abraham, the God of his fathers. Uh, he's sold out. He's working for Rome, the occupying army. Uh, and, and the Lord Jesus Christ goes to him. And he says, come follow me. And he leaves his seat tax collecting. Uh, and then remember, he throws a big party, and there's all those publicans and sinners there, and Jesus Christ is in the midst. Jesus cri gets criticized. Why eateth your master with publicans and sinners? Well, they that are whole don't need a physician, but they that are sick. I'm the great physician. I'm here to heal those who are sinners. Okay, so Matthew, the publican. So here's this guy. Um, He's a companion. He's a traitor to his country. Uh, he's a companion of pimps and prostitutes, and even worse than that, IRS agents. <laughs> just, just kidding, just kidding. Um, don't want to get audited by those gun-carrying uh, IRS agents, right? Uh, and, and so he, he is a traitor to his nation, okay? 
And then you have the Apostle Paul, Pharisee of the Pharisee, a ruler of the Jews. He is a lettered man. He has a ring. He has the scholarly robes. He was taught by Gamaliel. Uh, everybody, he was a man of renown. He had got official letters from the Roman government. He could go out and have people put to death. He was a man of authority. He would be one that the Pharisees would look up and say, hey, that's one of our guys right there. So, here's how funny the Lord is. Where does he send the Pharisee of the Pharisee to? Gentile dogs. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> A bunch of idol-worshiping, naked savages. Amen. You and I, Gentiles. That's right. Jesus sends the Pharisee of the Pharisees to the Gentiles. Where does he send this low-life Matthew the tax, tax collector to? Has him write the Gospel of Matthew, proving to the Jewish people that Jesus Christ is indeed the Messiah, amen, the Son of amen, God, amen, amen. the King of Kings. Why? So that no flesh can glory in his presence. That God is, God is in the business of choosing the weak things of this world to confound the wise. Said, Pastor, I'm a broken person. I got good news for you. The Lord Jesus is in the business of using broken people and fashioning them and molding them and doing something very useful unto them. Why? So that no flesh will glory in his presence. And we could take time and opportunity to illustration upon illustration of all the people that God has used in his kingdom uh, have for the most part been down and outers from all different walks of life. And God chooses these people and brings them unto himself. So look back at Mark chapter number three. So you see the people of his choosing. You got six fishermen there. You got a tax collector there. You got uh, Simon Zelotus there. He's a uh, political zealot. An interesting thing with Simon uh, is here's a political zealot. These zealots, are, and Josephus says, they carry long knives on them uh, just in case they saw a Roman soldier uh, unguarded by him. Himself. They would dispatch of this Roman soldier, kill him. Here's Simon, uh, who is a political zealot for the nation of Israel. He's working hand in hand. He's working with Matthew, the tax collector, uh, the, the, the former, former traitor to his nation. And there's a commonality in Christ. And you think about the body of Christ. You think about all the people in this room this morning, all different kinds of walks of life. Uh, and, and we would have probably uh, very little, uh, you know, a lot of us have very little to do with each other if it was not for the fact that the Lord Jesus Christ has called us and he is the common factor amen, amen. of us all this morning. Uh, and then secondly, I want you to notice the person of his choosing. In Mark chapter 3, and look at, um, and look at verse number 13, it says, And he goeth up into a mountain and calleth unto him whom he would, and they came unto him. He called whom he would. This was the absolute exact opposite of how teachers normally function. Usually you would apply to be a follower of Christ, but instead Christ came to him and said, come follow me. Remember the Lord Jesus Christ? He came to seek and to save that which was lost. Uh, remember that he goes after his lost sheep. He does not stop going after his lost sheep until he find it. Uh, so the Lord is after his own. The Bible says this, that no man seeketh after God. All have turned aside. The Lord Jesus Christ comes and he calls whom he would. He calls them to himself. Uh, so one thing about the person of his choosing, uh, we know the sovereignty of everything that God does. Um, I was listening to something this week. Did you know, you know how vast are in millions and millions and millions and millions of, millions of stars um, are in the Milky Way galaxy? Millions and millions and millions and millions and millions, millions, millions of stars, the vastness, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of miles across uh, our very own galaxy. Do you know that there's trillions of galaxies in the universe? Right. Trillions of galaxies in the universe. Um, if you're reading the Hubble telescope, there was a dark spot in space, and they zoomed in on that dark spot in space. 
and oh, there's a billion or more galaxies in that dark spot in space. That's pretty incredible. Yeah. Pretty vast sure. universe. Amen, amen. You know, if you look at the, at, at the macro of the world, the world is an amazing place. Now, let me tell you something about Jesus. It says in John, Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse number 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. And all things were made by Him, and was not anything made that was made. Do you know that the Lord Jesus Christ is not just a baby in a manger, that He is Creator God, that He spoke all Amen. the worlds into existence? Amen. You see that vastness? You know there's physics, like really, really smart people. Are like so smart, they could combine all of our knowledge in this room and they'd be smarter than all of us. Amen. There's some really weird people out there, I tell you. <laughs> then they start talking about things like multiverses. I mean, these really smart people. I mean, we're not talking just like your Marvel comic book uh, movie, you know, but you know, just the complex. Okay, so we look at the macro, look at how vast the world is. Okay, look at the micro. Did you know that, get through the microscope, that if your atoms in your body were as large as apples, that you would be so large that you could hold the world in the palm of your hands. That's just what's going on on a micro scale inside your very own body. And we say the vastness and the wisdom of God. So when he says, my thoughts are higher than your thoughts and my ways are higher than... He's not exaggerating. <laughs> <laughs> then at the same time, the Lord said that a sparrow cannot fall to the ground without the Father's knowledge. And be of good cheer, you are much more valuable than many sparrows. And you notice he didn't say an eagle fall to the ground. He said a sparrow. Guess what you're looking at this morning? A sparrow. <laughs> Guess what I'm looking at? A bunch of sparrows. And so we think about this, and we think, well, the vast creation and the vast universe, how do I know that I am significant? How do I know that God loves me? You know, it says in, in John chapter number one, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth that God became and made like unto his brethren. We have this great high priest that is touched with the feeling of our infirmities, was tempted in all points like you and I are, yet without sin. There's not one single thing that you are going through this morning that Jesus Christ did not personally experience here in this earth. He was tempted in all points like you and I are, Yet without sin, the Lord Jesus Christ knows what it is like to be you. He has walked a mile in your footsteps, and he is touched with the feeling of your infirmities. God became man. And then another thing about the Lord Jesus Christ, here is the righteous God. Uh, here is righteous, holy God who has given forth his holy Law. His law is going to be magnified. He magnified his word above his own name. Here's a fallen race here this morning. Mm -hmm. yeah. And not only does God know you from beginning to end, he not only knows you now, but he knows you also in eternity future. I mean, he, he's, he already sees you in the kingdom that is to come and your service there. He loves you from beginning all the way into eternity. He knows you and he loves you. Uh, and then on top of that, the Lord Jesus Christ satisfied the holiness of God as he lived a holy life that you could never live. And when he died on the cross, he didn't die for just everybody. He died for individuals in particular. That means that he died for all of my sins, specifically that the Lord Jesus Christ became Jack Young on the cross. Amen. 
that he took my sin all on himself. He knows all my sin, past, present, and future, became sin, took the wrath of God, took, took the, the righteous law's demands there on the cross, and I who deserve to die in my sins, he died for me on that cross so that I might become the righteousness of God in him, that he clothed me with his righteousness. And so the Lord is intimate with all of his people. He knows you better than you know yourself. And so all of these men, though they lived in obscurity and were from obscure positions and different walks of life, he knew them. Many of them, he renamed them. You need a new name, Simon. You need a new name. Ju poor Judas, he renames them here because, you know, wouldn't you have to explain the rest? I'm not the bad guy, okay? Yeah. Uh, he, I guarantee <laughs> Yeah, he, you know, yeah. he went by an alias the rest of his life after Judas betrayed the Lord. Yeah. Uh, and so he, he knows these men. He's intimate with these men. He calls them to himself. And so this is the God who chose you and I to walk with him. And he's the one who has his will and his way in our life and molds us into what he wants for us to be. It says in Ephesians 2.10, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. These men were ordained here. If you're saved this morning, you are ordained for a specific line of service. Uh, and so here was the apostles part. Look at uh, verse number 13. And he goeth up into a mountain and calleth unto him whom he would, and they came unto him. They heard the master's voice and they answered his calling. He says, come follow me. And they came unto the Lord. The Lord's voice is calling out this morning. It says in Proverbs chapter number one, that wisdom uttereth her voice in the streets, calling to all to come in unto her. And so the Lord called and their answer was yes. Jesus invited all his disciples to come and take up their cross and follow me. Jesus said in 12, uh, John 12, 32, If I be high and lifted up, I will call all men unto me. How was the Lord Jesus Christ lifted up? On the cross. That's right, brother. That's right. He said, If any man come after me, he must take up his cross and follow me. Amen. The opportunity to serve Jesus is an opportunity to come and die. But that's not just it. Uh, we just don't celebrate death this morning. Uh, we're here on the first day of the week. We're not celebrating on uh, the creation on Saturday. Uh, we're celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ on Sunday. Uh, and so he says, come, take up your cross and follow me. And so here's what the invitation is, if you're going to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. Die that, so that ye might live. Die to yourself. Die unto me so that you might have life and that you might have life more abundantly. John chapter number 11. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me shall never die. You know, there's only two roads that you can go on this morning. Jesus said, I'm the way, the way, the truth, and the life. If you go Jesus' way, that's a straight and narrow way. You've got to go through a straight and narrow gate. Broad is the way that leads to uh, destruction. Uh, and narrow is the way that leads unto life. And so there's only two ways this morning. Jesus said... This He says, I, I come that they might have life and that they might have life more abundantly. And it says, he that hath the Son hath what? Life. And he that hath not the Son of God hath not life, but the wrath of God abides upon him. There's only the way of death and there's the way of life. When Jesus calls you to come follow him, to come take up your cross, he says, die to your own way, die to self so that you might live, so that you might be resurrected. And let me tell you something, it doesn't matter what life throws at you, uh, if you take up your cross and follow the Lord Jesus Christ, you can do anything. 
I'm reading, read through the Gospels here. Uh, I think it was last week I finished up on the Gospels in my own Bible reading. Uh, and John the Baptist was in prison. Okay? Uh, and so I imagine you and I would have a few doubts. We got thrown into prison for the faith. So he sends his disciples over to Jesus and says, um, Are you he that should come, or should we look for another? I think that's a pretty fair question, you know. He's thrown away in a dungeon. Uh, and Jesus just says, Go tell John that the blind receive their sight, and that the lame walk, and the poor have the gospel preached unto them. All he does is quote from the Old Testament. He goes back, and here's a report. John, here's what Jesus said. He says, The blind receive their sight, and the lame walk, uh, and the dead are raised, and uh, the, lepers are, the lepers are cleansed, and the poor have the gospel preached unto them. You know what John's response back was? Nothing. That's all I need to hear. That's it. We sing, if Jesus goes with me, I'll go anywhere. You know, Jesus said to his disciples, you know, they came up to him and they said, we have left lands and houses and families and come follow thee. And he says, well, I got news for you. He says that he that have given up anything uh, for my sake, lands, families, houses shall receive a hundredfold in this life and in the life to come. And so I want to tell you this morning, I want to testify to you this morning, anything that I, Jack Young has given up for the Lord Jesus Christ, I have received again 100-fold in this life. The Lord is so good to me and blesses me with his presence. And you think of anything that you put on the cross, anything that you've given up for the Lord Jesus Christ, that you have received back so much more than you ever gave up for him. And so here's the Lord. Here's the Lord uh, in his sovereignty. Here's the Lord uh, in, in calling for his disciples' submission. And uh, here's the call to you and I this morning. In Luke chapter number 9, verse number 57, Jesus calls people into discipleship. And it says, And it came to pass that as they went in the way, a certain man said unto him, Lord, I follow thee whithersoever thou goest. And Jesus said unto him, The foxes have holes, and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. And he said to another, Follow me. But he said, Lord, suffer me first to go bury my father. Jesus said unto him, Let the dead bury their dead, but go thou and preach the kingdom of God. And another also said, Lord, I will follow thee, but let me first go bid them farewell that are in at the home at my house. And Jesus said unto him, No man, having put his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. God calls disciples into radical service for him. And then finally, if you look it down at verse number 14, we're going to see the purpose for his choosing. The purpose for his choosing. Verse 14, it says, And he ordained, or he called twelve, I want you to notice this, that they should be with him. So what's the advantage of the Christian life? Tell you, tell you what, we have Jesus. Amen. Amen. That's right, brother. Amen. So God became flesh, and the Lord Jesus Christ is a person, and we get to know him personally. That you and I uh, get to spend time with the creator of all the world. And that the creator of all the world wants a relationship with you. Yes, sir. The question must be asked, yes, you know, this is a question of humanity. How do I know that God loves me? How do we know? Hereby we perceive the love of God that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And if Christ died for us and uh, has given us his son, wouldn't God freely give to us all things? That the Lord Jesus Christ makes himself known to us and he wants to have a relationship with us. And here's the number one purpose of your life. To be with him. That God wants you with him. Why did Jesus die for you on the cross? 
so that you might know him and that you might be with him and so that you could have fellowship with God personally. Uh, the greatest thing in your life, and here's one of the reasons why uh, you know that you're saved, is that because when you receive the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, um, there's nothing more exciting in the world than the reality of the Lord Jesus Christ. Some of you here this morning, and you know, let me say, you know, if there was a time in your life where you were closer to God than you are right now, you know what that means? You're backslidden. Go back to where you were. Go back where you uh, left your first love. The Bible says, let's say you lost your first love. If you lost something, you might not know where to find it. So go back where you left it. Yeah. But man, one of, the one of the great realities of being saved is having this real relationship with the God of all glory and that you can get alone with him and that you can uh, allow him to speak into your life through the word of God uh, and that you let the word of God dwell in you richly and in all wisdom in your relationship to the Lord Jesus Christ through his word uh, and, and uh, you fellowship through and you commune with that word and uh, God speaks to you through his word and when he speaks to you through his word uh, you get to speak back in prayer and have this fellowship with him and had this intimate walk with the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says that the steps of a good man are ordered uh, by the Lord and that you have a, have a reality that the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ is going to be with you. Jesus said, Lo, I'm with you always, even unto the end of the world. And if you're God's child this morning, no matter what you got going on this week, that the Lord Jesus Christ is going to go with you. Amen. And you can count him as present in your life uh, and that uh, he will be with you. He says he ordained 12 that they should be with him and then that they should go forth and that they should preach. And a calling is the same thing for you and I this morning. Jesus said, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and to preach the gospel to every creature. You know, when we spend time with the Lord in his word, there's so many avenues now. I mean, I know in this modern age, modern technology, we got a thousand different voices screaming to us from all over. Yeah. Uh, we always have a screen in front of our face. Uh, it's always something playing in our ears. Sure. Uh, this is so much different than how our ancestors grew up. I mean, you know, most of our ancestors were, you know, staring at the back of a mule all day while they plowed their fields and no radio to turn on, nothing, and they had more time to meditate and be quiet. Uh, but you and I have so much available to us, audio Bible, uh, we can pull up the Bible on our phones, we've got, how many have more than one Bible in your house? You've got Bibles all over, uh, and, and uh, we have that time where we can shut everything off and plug into the Lord, and we can let the Word of Christ dwell in us richly, uh, and uh, we spend time with the Lord. Do you know the f if we get the first part right, the second part is not a problem at all. When I find out if I'm walking with the Lord and I have a fresh relationship with the Lord and I'm excited about the time that I've spent with the Lord, it is not hard for me to share those things of the Lord. It says in Psalms, our, pen, our tongue is a pen of a ready writer. You know what we talk about? You know, in the, the Bible, the greatest commandment is to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, and mind. And uh, here's, what I, here's what I find is that we're always talking about things that we love. Some of you could, you could name the starting lineup for your NFL team today, but you couldn't name the 12 apostles. It's what you love. You know, if we, if we love the Lord and spend time with him, it's going to be easy for us to go forth and preach. And as we spend time with the Lord, here is how this radical change is done. These people are going to turn the world upside down, these simple fishermen. It says in Acts 4, 13, it says, and now, and, and here's Peter preaching in Acts chapter number four. He says, this same Jesus whom ye crucified, God hath made both Lord and Christ. So here's what he's saying to people who have the power to kill him. 
Okay? And then in Acts 4.13, here's all these lettered men in, in Jerusalem. It says, Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, right? God chose the lowly things of this world, confound yeah, the wise. Yeah, yeah. They're unlearned and ignorant men. They marveled. And it says, And they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. There's a great evangelist, D.L. Moody, Dwight Lyman Moody. And, and uh, D.L. Moody in the mid-1800s preached all over America. Uh, more than a million people uh, received Christ as their Savior under the preaching of D.L. Moody. Wonderfully, miraculously changed. He'd have people stand up. If you want to receive the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, stand up right where you're at. And he'd do this uh, in his meetings. And uh, over a million people stood up to receive the Lord Jesus Christ uh, as his Savior. He preached both in America. Then he also preached in England. Uh, and as, as uh, historians said, he took America in one hand, he took England in another hand, and he raised them both up unto God. Uh, and, of course, people from all over, uh, see God using a man like that. They want to go see and see what the secret sauce is. Uh, and uh, it was funny as people go, here Dwight Lyman, uh, they heard a person who butchered the king's English. Many times when he read his text, he had mispronounced things there in his text. Uh, he worked very hard studying the Bible, but didn't have a formal education uh, when he saved as a teenager. Uh, at the age of 19 years old, he was a shoe salesman in Chicago. And uh, here's what D.L. Moody said about uh, the this, this secret of, of uh, getting ministry done. Here's what he says. He said, if you really study God's word, I believe you get so full of it that you can't help but speak it out. The reason so many don't care to work for God is that they are so empty, they can't find anything to say. You can't bring water out of a dry well. There are two ways of getting water. One is by pumping now, many Christians are like these pumps, and you have to pump a long time before you get anything. The other kind of well is what they call an artesian well. They just dig down until they come to the very fountain itself, hundreds of feet below, then up springs the water into the air. They don't need any pumping then. I wish Christians would be like artesian wells ever springing up to eternal life. The difference, I know the difference. I've had to talk to people, you know, just think if you're a pastor, people calling you for religious advice and you are, do not even feel saved at the moment, you know, right? You're like going to the pump, trying to pump some water up. It's like, please, before the end of this conversation, Lord, I would like a little bit of water to spring up. Uh, you know, you, you, you in no wise feel like, you know, David, uh, thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Uh, your cup ain't running over. It's not spilling over. Uh, and you're saying, oh, please, Lord, please, and you're pumping on this well. Give me something to say to this person right here that would be a blessing to them. Uh, but then, uh, fortunately, every once in a while, you know, 2% uh, of the time, uh, I've had a wonderful walk with the Lord. And I've been dwelling in him, and he's been dwelling in me. And I can say with the psalmist, my, my tongue is a pen of a ready writer. I am ready to talk about the things which I have both seen and I have both heard. Uh, and I'm, I, I'm excited, and I'm excited to go. Remember this, Christian, that your number one calling is to be with him. So let me ask you this morning, how is your prayer life? Let me ask you this morning, how's your Bible read? I, you know, I... I'm, I'm a scheduler. I like checking things off a list. I've gotten into ruts in my Bible reading where I'm checking it off the list. I'm not going to let Ernie read more Bible than I am, bless God. <laughs> but I'm not having a real, intimate walk with the Lord. Remember this. We should feel honored. We should feel pri privileged. You know, if you've got an invitation... Uh, you know, for the king, from the king of England to come dine with him, you'd be telling everybody about it. Yeah, right? I hear you, brother. Amen. Uh, you'd be going through the protocol. You'd, you'd have to go to the special classes, you know, figuring out how you approach the king. Curtsy. Curtsy. I, I don't know how you do. Um, and, uh, man, you would be so excited. Well, you have an invitation from the king of kings. Yes, sir. And it's not just an open-ended invitation. It's 
God calling you by name. And he created you. He didn't create you to be anybody else. He created you to be yourself. One of my personal mantras in my life, and I try to remember this, is that God did not call me to be like anybody else. And so here it is. Be Jack. That's not for you. That's for me. Be Jack. And God wants you to be who he called you to be, and, and he's only going to make you who he called you to be as you spend time with him. And then it says, and he sent them forth with power. And he sent them forth with power. So go forth, go forth in power. Now, let me say this. These apostles were sent. You are sent as well. The Bible says, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. God will change you, and it's not something that, it's something that happens organically. It's something that happens naturally as you love the Lord, as you spend time with him. Um, I, I, was, I was thinking back, it's probably about 10 years ago, uh, we had Dr. Chuck Harding up in uh, First Baptist of Black River preaching on a Sunday morning. And remember, there was five people saved that Sunday morning, uh, and one of the guys that was saved, his name was John Palamon. And he got wonderfully, miraculously saved. I mean, many of his children and things got saved in our church, and he has since moved out to Montana. Uh, but I remember he'd only been saved uh, for probably about a month, and him and I were going through discipleship. And um, he came to Sunday evening service one night, and he literally had tears come down his eyes. He was telling me about this. He said, I was working on something this afternoon, Pastor. And he says, I was hammering a nail in, and he said, I hit my thumb. With the hammer. Been there. And he said this, I didn't cuss. And this is why he was crying. And the thing is, is he wasn't trying not to cuss. He was just walking with the Lord Amen. at that work. moment. That'll work, brother. And Jesus through him didn't cuss. Let me tell you something. Is that this week, you're being sent forth into this world. Jesus wants to make himself manifest to you, and he also wants to make himself manifest to the world. Yes, and as you live in him, he lives through you, and you will be a testimony, you will be a blessing to your home, to your workplace, to your relatives, to the people that you'll come across with. Your calling is to be with him and to go forth. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. And we thank you that we, we serve a God who knows us. He knows us by name. Uh, he, he knows us intimately, knows us better than we know ourselves. And Lord, we thank you for your great love towards us. We thank you for just that you are wanting and willing uh, to be our shepherd, to be our savior. And Lord, I pray that you would help us to answer your call. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to thank you for watching the sermon today. If you'd like to find out more information about our church, you can visit our church website at lbbc.info. If you'd like to email us, you can email us at mylbbc at gmail. I also have a website, pastorjack.org. You can sign up for my blog there. Uh, and then also we do have a podcast. It's called the Pastoral Thoughts Podcast. And you can find that on podcast apps. And you can also find that on YouTube. God bless you. Thanks again for watching. And we'll see you next time.